Welcome to Advisory Opinions. I'm Sarah Isger. That's David French. And David, it's not slowing down. It's not June, man. What? This is April. I thought, oh, we could like ease into June. We're going to talk about the dueling abortion rulings in Texas and Washington state. Yes, we will talk about the Clarence Thomas ProPublica article. And then we've got uh, sort of a transgender basket. The Supreme Court rejects a case about sports. The Biden administration releases a proposed rulemaking. And then we have a pronoun case as well. And finally, Governor Greg Abbott talking about pardoning a a guy in Texas related to stand your ground laws that obviously David will have thoughts on. (laughs) Indeed. All right, David, let's start with the dueling abortion rulings. Do you want to set this up a little bit? Yeah. So what we have are, this is a situation that I don't think we really, maybe even in all our discussions of, um, in all our discussions of uh, nationwide injunctions, hadn't really set up well, but in hindsight seems really obvious. And that is, what do you do if one court in one jurisdiction says stop and another court in another jurisdiction says go. <laughs> and so it's really relatively rare, you know, when all this talk about nationwide injunctions, um, it hasn't happened much before. There's like one or two around, for instance, DACA or Obamacare, where you can sort of find them. And even here, I think that the better argument is that these are in direct conflict with each other. But even here, there's an argument that there's not, at least, because one of them, the Texas one, is about the 2020, sorry, 2000 approval of Mifeprestone, the RU486, abortion uh, drug that you might have heard about. And the other one is about the 2023 restrictions. And so in theory, if you get rid of the 2000 approval, the 2023 restrictions are meaningless. On the other hand, the injunction in the 2023 restriction case said that the FDA was required to maintain the status quo. And so that's where the duelingness comes from. Yes. So what we, what we basically have is a lawsuit against the FDA approval of the drug, uh, one of the two drugs, the first drug and the two drug cocktail that is typically used for medical abortions. And so essentially what you're doing is you're, the plaintiffs are doing is saying this, this 2000 approval is, um, was unlawful, was improper, and they're challenging this in court. Now, what's interesting about this are a number of things beyond the merits of the case. The merits are in the least interesting part in terms of like how this is going to get resolved. It ain't going to be on the merits. And if you're wondering how we're now litigating a 2000 approval, like the year 2000, like Y2K, <laughs> you're right. That's weird. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we got a lot here to talk about that is, has nothing to do, has nothing at all to do with whether the FDA properly approved the drug. Um, so one of the questions is standing. So these are these are our doctors who are claiming, in essence, that they have standing because other doctors may prescribe the drug. The dr- the the law the doctors who are um, raising this lawsuit are essentially saying other doctors could prescribe the drug. The drug has problems, which should have required FDA not to approve it. Those problems have spillover effects, including uh, patients going into the hospital patients being sent to them, for example, for further treatment, et cetera. So that's going to give them standing. They're, the standing is derived from the secondary effects of the bad effects of the medicine. Then you have a statute of limitations issue. Now, there was a 2000 approval, an administrative challenge to that approval that I don't believe was resolved into until 2016, very long administrative process. But lawsuit on that 2000 approval that was challenged and the challenge wasn't resolved until 2016 should have been brought months earlier in 2022, even though, um, and plaintiffs say, well, wait a minute, this was essentially reset. The 2000 approval was reset by a much later, I believe, 2016 expansion, um, and revision of the terms of the approval of the medication. There's an exhaustion of, of claims question. Um, there are a lot of questions here, Sarah, that will result in the case, I would say, largely being ultimately decided without any reference at all 
to the underlying merits of the FDA approval is my best read on it. And my best read on which injunction controls is uh, unclear. Therefore, I don't know about you, but are you expecting some appellate, uh, some appellate activity on this really, really soon? Because the judge in the Northern District of Texas who issued the injunction against the drug um, has stayed the ruling for a few days, I believe only about seven days. So I'm expecting some sort of appellate something before the seven days is my best guess. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on A, which injunction controls, B, B standing, C, statute of limitations before we get into the actual merits of the claim itself. Nobody's getting into the merits of this case, except every headline in America. <laughs> but if you're a lawyer, the merits are so... Uh, tertiary isn't even the right thing here. Um, okay, so one... I think there were some shenanigans here, David. We knew, everyone knew that the Kazmarek, Judge Kazmarek, um, was the sort of fireworks case here. Uh, the hearing got a lot of coverage. The Even just the filings got quite a bit of coverage. And so we've been waiting for about six weeks for this. Now, you and I talked about whether to just cover the hearing itself or the complaints, and we decided to wait for the actual opinion because, frankly, otherwise it's just a lot of conjecture about like how a district court hearing went. This podcast is generally an appellate podcast. But that's all to say everyone knew this was coming any day now type thing. So it comes out on Friday afternoon and then two hours later, you have the quote unquote dueling injunction um, out of Washington. A lot of people speculating that that's not a coincidence in timing. And let me tell you why um, uh, I at least acknowledge the possibility that it's not a coincidence, which is without the dueling injunction, <laughs> which um, the opinion's pretty flimsy in the Washington state one in terms of uh, it's not a nationwide injunction. It only applies to the states that sued, but it is an injunction instead of being an administrative 705 state. It doesn't matter what that is right now. What matters is that it was just sort of like, yeah, yeah, definitely for sure. And let's not worry about standing right now or any of these other nitty gritty things that matter. Let's just do it. Um, so there's that. But also, if you want to talk about speeding up appellate review, you know what'll do it? Dueling injunctions, where the government has to find a resolution. Um, so to get to your point, David, yes, I think this will have fast resolution. The question, though, is whether it's going to come from the Fifth Circuit, which in the past has not felt a lot of need for speed, if you will, on some of these things. Um, or whether, in fact, the Supreme Court is going to have to take it before the Fifth Circuit can rule on it. And we saw some of this happen around that SB8 law, David. Do you remember where, like, the Fifth Circuit just didn't really do anything, and then the Supreme Court got, it's like July, and we're like, what is happening here? I think we could be heading for something kind of similar. Um, it puts the Department of Justice in a bad spot. Um, and, but it, it will get resolved. That's the point of this. And that's going to take me to where like my dark place is this weekend. There's a whole lot. I mean, not a whole lot, but more than I'd like. And that's one, um, you know, AOC on the left, Nancy Mace on the right, saying that the Biden administration should simply ignore the rulings that they don't like from district judges that they don't think are quote unquote legitimate. And I guess, you know, David, I could do like a whole rant on why that's stupid and undermines the rule of law. I have a whole separate rant on how like particularly stupid it is. This isn't the Supreme Court. This is a district court. You have two layers of review. Hold your horses. Everyone gets district court opinions they don't like. The Trump administration had multiple injunctions on the travel ban, something that they then won at the Supreme Court. They didn't just ignore all of those injunctions in the meantime. That's not how this works. But instead, David, I think I just find it really depressing. I just, for some reason, the fight wasn't in me this weekend. And instead, I just, really sitting congresswomen. 
and Senator Wyden, by the way, and a, so a sitting senator, not just sort of info, you know, left wing infotainment celebrity AOC, but also a Republican Nancy Mace. I mean, this isn't even it's bipartisan. Again, it's not stupidity. It's something far more insidious to me. Um, I don't know. I just feel like the rule of law has not been winning a lot of these rounds lately. And it's kind of kind of bothering me. Um, but so that's the first thing. I do think this will get resolved quickly on appeal and we will be talking about it more. What was your second one? Um, standing. Neither of these have standing. <laughs> Uh, but this gets to another problem that frankly, I lay more at the Supreme court's feet than either of these district courts. They know that the standing jurisprudence has not given good guidance to lower courts and they continue to not resolve it over the objections of some of the justices, by the way. But here's the result is that they're like, uh, yeah, they're standing in the cases that I think there should be standing in. Um, so there's that. I mean, in the Texas case, you have a pro-life doctors group suing. Now, I mean, again, I don't think they have standing, but we've seen doctors groups sue on the other side before, for instance. Right. And so this gets to the abortion distortion when it comes to standing idea, which has happened in the past. I wonder whether left-wing groups will see why that expanding standing was a double-edged sword, but maybe not. Maybe, I think there are people of good faith out there who just legitimately believe, let's just expand the standing requirements. We should have more lawsuits challenging government behavior, not fewer. I, I'm open to that argument. Frankly, I, you know, conservatives in general have been for contracting standing. I think now they're more in favor of expanding standing. Um, I'm not sure anyone's over time been principled on this in terms of one side or another, but I know individuals have been. Yeah. Yeah. As the sides go, it's whichever side feels presently insecure about. Yes. And right now both do. So they're both like, yeah, more standing. The yeah, Washington exactly. case is brought on behalf of states, um, basically sitting on behalf of their citizens' interests. That also has been, as we've talked about, an area of a lot of interest to the Supreme Court. Do states, what is their special solicitude, quote unquote, to bring cases? Um, we certainly know states can bring cases when it's dealing with their own sovereign power, but this isn't that. This is bringing a case um, on behalf of their citizens. What? <laughs> that's not yeah. even, that's not a thing. <laughs> At least in Massachusetts v. EPA, the whole argument, and again, you can smirk if you want, but it was Massachusetts will literally lose part of Massachusetts because of climate change as their oceans erode, or sorry, as their uh, beaches erode, et cetera. So like, there won't be as much of Massachusetts. That's our sovereign interest. I don't know. <laughs> you know, you can sort of. <laughs> there won't be as much of Massachusetts. <laughs> that's my very, that's my very loose explanation of how Massachusetts v. EPA went down. I like that. There will be less Massachusetts. <laughs> so we Massachusetts want all of our Massachusetts back. Um, these cases have enormous procedural standing, et cetera, problems. They're both great cases of abortion distortion on both sides, I think, in terms of the hoops that the judges had to jump through in order to get to the merits. Um, what was third, David? Statute of limitations. Oh, okay. So this is, this is another procedural problem with the Texas case, not the Washington case. So in the Texas case, remember I said this is like a Y2K case. Like literally I was in college when they're talking about reaching back. It's been 23 years. So how are they able to do that? They're arguing, a, it's not obscure, but it's kind of obscure, administrative procedure doctrine called reopening. That basically, if the agency reopened the discussion over something that happened, they approved in the past or an action they took in the past, that then that reopening is when the statute of limitations tolls from. In this case, they're arguing that a reopening happened in 2016 and that allows them to reach back to that 2000 approval. The FDA is a little bit unique because generally when we talk about reopening, it's very easy to see whether they are simply revisiting a previous decision. When you're talking about the, e uh, the FDA um, looking at drugs, you're constantly re-looking at drugs and what they're good for, what they're not going to be good for, new studies, et cetera. That, at least in the past, I don't think has um, really been the foundation for a true reopening argument like this. I think no, <laughs> but I'm not a reopening expert. It should go without 
needing to say. Um, so there's that problem. But David, overall, again, I, I find the two opinions um, a little bit depressing, except that like there have been bonkers district court opinions every yeah. day of the year going back forever. So in that sense, it's like, meh, there's two bonkers district court opinions. I think they're both wrong. Um, and I, I do want to get to the merits in a second because that is a slightly different discussion, but the merits don't matter if you can't get in the courthouse door. And I don't think either of these get in the courthouse door. Um, but what I have found really upsetting is the reaction to it, that now we're just at a point where it's not even like headline news, really, that if you don't like a district court opinion, we're just not going to follow it anymore. And I see no downsides to that. AOC or Nancy Mace or Ron Wyden. Really? You don't nothing just seems OK to you. OK. Yeah. Let, let me let's pause on on this for a minute, because I'm getting a lot of questions on things like, well, how do we go forward when the courts are nothing but another sort of highly politicized, extremely um, corrupt institution like our legislature and our executive? And I'm thinking objection, presuming facts, not in evidence. OK, I, I OK, I want to stick up for the court system here for a moment. Um, let's just put aside for a moment the side eye that we both have at the district court opinions, the both of these district court opinions, which we have side eye at both district court opinions for different reasons. And just, and as you said, note for the record that it is not uncommon to get and has never been uncommon, especially with the combination of forum shopping um, and just the sheer number of district court judges to get some pretty interesting district court opinions. I'm thinking, for example, also of, remember the uh, special master down in the Northern District, I mean, the Southern District of Florida with around Trump. Oh, right, right. That's a great example of like total bonker stuff that like, just give it a sec, guys. This will work out. Yes, yes, just give it a moment. Just give it a moment. And and there have been district court opinions that are that merit side eye it's a legal process. It's a legal process. And the fact that everything doesn't get it resolved in 24, 48, 72 hours is actually okay. <laughs> it's actually all right. And then the other thing that I keep getting back to is a lot of people are questioning, quote unquote, the legitimacy of the courts based entirely on the outcome of cases. Okay. The case is not coming out the way that I want the case to come out. So therefore, the, there's something illegitimate about the courts. Because I really haven't heard a sophisticated argument that says there's something other at its essence illegitimate about the court system. Um, you're not dealing with district court judges or, or appellate court judges who are appointed outside of the normal process of the rule of law. Um, as someone who's, you know, a lot of people uh, on, on my left who are really angry at the courts look at conservative judges and this is kind of shading into another area and believe that some of them are corrupt. Um, I look at the jurisprudence from conservative judges and you know what I see? A lot of conservative jurisprudence. It is not corrupt to have conservative jurisprudence. That is a legal philosophy with which you, that you may disagree with, but it is not corrupt to hold to that legal philosophy. It is. Uh, so, you know, again, I don't want to shade too much into the other conversation, but one of the one of the markers for corruption for me is not. Is Judge Smith ruling consistent with Judge Smith's 40 years of legal philosophy? A a strain, a, a question would arise for me is if Judge Smith departed from uh, significant departed from his or her legal philosophy to issue a ruling in a case involving suspicious circumstances, that would be indicia or evidence of corruption. But being an originalist is not corruption. Okay, let's, <laughs> let's just get that out there. Neither is being a progressive jurist. It is not corruption. And so I'm getting really weary of this analysis of the courts that goes something along the lines of, man, courts are really ruling against the positions I would like them to rule uh, for. Therefore, the judges are corrupt, the system is illegitimate, and let's chuck it. No, no. And the interesting thing is, 
every one of these layers of courts and really every one of the jurists that people are angry about, et cetera, et cetera, it's hard for me to think of an exception where these courts and or these jurists ruled in such a way as to save the American election in 2020. So that was valid, right? And that went against, quote unquote, partisan interests, right? And we just skate over that as if there's, you know, that's an irrelevant factor in the consideration of whether or not the courts are corrupt when the fact of the matter is the courts held on a bipartisan basis, and by bipartisan, I mean by nominee, by who nominated them, one of the severest stress tests on our system that we've experienced in my lifetime, and they just held, and they went from a bulwark of democracy in November 2020 through January 2021, and now they're illegitimate? No, no. That's why I don't like it. That's why it feels so bad to me is because it's not... Um, it's so cheap. It's so transparent. And yet it's so effective. And it's, it's what other people believe. They're not just by themselves out there on some island saying this. Right, exactly. And then the more people, and I, I'd like to say this is just a Twitter phenomenon. But as we've learned, these Twitter phenomena, they leak out all over the real world. And, and there it is leaking out all over the real world. And let's just press the pause button on the crisis and the rule of law until the process works itself out. Um, I do want to give a, one pushback though, David. I don't think that this happens in a era of the judicial filibuster. Let me explain. Agree, but explain. Uh, and remember that um, Harry Reid got rid of the judicial filibuster for lower court nominees and then Mitch McConnell got rid of the filibuster for Supreme Court nominees for my purposes, it doesn't actually matter which party did it, but I'm not, the Supreme Court one's not going to be as relevant right now because it's far more recent. That happened with the Gorsuch nomination. And so we haven't, I think, seen the full effects of getting rid of the filibuster for the Supreme Court on Supreme Court nominees. I think Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett would have been the nominees for any Republican in any era. Um, so leave that aside for a second. I think it, the, getting rid of the judicial filibuster for the Supreme Court nominees has affected the lower court nominees, but certainly getting rid of the judicial filibuster for the lower court nominees, we've had a longer runway to see the effects. I would argue that it is affecting how people who want to be judges act and how judges act. And then how people treat those judges when they act in a way that they don't like. So I'm going to take those in reverse order. One, if you knew that Judge Kaczmarek or whichever judge ruled in that case um, had bipartisan support in order to get onto the bench in the first place, I think it would just undermine anyone saying that like the courts are illegitimate, you can just ignore this decision. Because the Senate was such a deliberative body on these things and you had to have so much bipartisan support to move anything, um, it just sort of took the wind out of those sails because there were so many deals and scrutiny uh, being applied to these judges. So back up a second then. How do I think it's changing the way the judges behave? Well, I think that the Kaczmarek opinion itself has some things in it that wouldn't be in there if the judicial filibuster were still in place. For instance, um, there's a footnote about why he's not going to use the term fetus and only use the term unborn person. There's another footnote about Planned Parenthood's history related to eugenics and the Rockefellers. Um, there's then, those are footnotes. Then in the opinion itself, there's a sentence about how perhaps the 14th Amendment's uh, you know, guarantee of life applies to unborn persons, and therefore abortion itself is unconstitutional. That has nothing to do with the case here. It's just in there as like a, an aside, like thoughts from the desk of Judge Kaczmarek, frankly. Um, and that's why it's one sentence. I think that that is a result of the new incentives on judges without this judicial filibuster because 
if you want to get a promotion to the circuit, or you just want to have a reputation within, um, you know, judging, et cetera, you no longer need or want to have that bipartisan support. It used to be the case, David, that you always used to say, uh, you nominate the most conservative person you can get confirmed. But if you're only dealing with your own side, that moves the line way over to the flanks of both. And frankly, those people, um, and now I'm going to move to number one, the, who wants to be a judge in the first place, but it applies to those who want promotions as well. Your concern is no longer with uh, angering or alienating the middle or the other side. Your concern is getting outflanked. And so we're seeing that time and time again. And I think both of these cases are really good examples of that because they both go out of their way to provide uh, fan service to the people who agree with the outcome in a way that opinions didn't, it was very rare to see an opinion written that way. I'll put it that way. And it's becoming way less rare. Yeah. No, we, you know, we've talked about this before and I think it's a really, really important point to underline. And, you know, it's interesting in the filibuster era, I was aware back in my practice of law days, you know, when you were working in a legal community, you could see and you would know the lawyers who had expectations or desires to be a judge. And they had a different path that they took than many lawyers who had no expectation or desire to be a judge. And, you know, one of the things, and, and there were some good, there were some positive and negative aspects of it. Um, one of the positive aspects is many of these people went out of their way to be sort of seen as the, um, what, what would be a good way of putting it, um, very serious and sober-minded. In other words, they were not going to go into court and pitch hysterical fits, <laughs> for example. They had a demeanor that was designed to give people assurance that they were serious and sober-minded individuals. It's the John Roberts model, which you can complain about, but the John Roberts model is do as little as possible, um, judicial restraint, lawyerly restraint, only deal with the issue directly in front of you. Why would you reach superfluous additional things that could only pin you down later? Yep. And they were scholarly, but in a non-confrontational way. So their scholarship might be, I've just published a law review on the 19th, uh, the 1907 uh, constitutional convention amendment process in the state of Nebraska, something I just completely made up, <laughs> but a maybe an interesting point of administrative law or an interesting point of past state constitutional law or whatever that demonstrated their intellectual seriousness without taking a position on a hot button issue of the day. And so you can begin to see the picture that I'm painting. There was a judicial career track that was sober, that was serious, that was intentionally non-controversial. And this has had several effects to it um, as, as far as who got nominated, who got approved, how law was practiced. And now that's changed. Now, what's interesting to me, Sarah, is ever since the judicial filibuster was killed, we have not had, and correct me if I'm wrong here, we have not had a situation where the president did not, con the president's party did not control the Senate. Not yet. Not yet. That's going to change the dynamic pretty considerably because back in the era of the filibuster, there was a pressure to confirm qualified judges that w existed. And there were a few circumstances where the filibuster was absolutely wielded unjustly. There's just, in my mind, little question of that. Um, but as a general matter, the Senate knew that the judiciary had to be staffed. There had to be people there. And so there was this, um, again, the system, I, I think there's a defensible argument that parts of the system were breaking down, but I think Harry Reid pulled the trigger way fast on this way fast on this. And we've been living with the consequences ever since, but it has really changed the way in which people who are considering um, a judicial career or think they might be, uh, have a judicial career might be possible for them. It's really changed the way you do this. Because if you go the old route, 
no one's going to nominate you anymore because you're iffy. You haven't clearly staked out your your claim and it's just completely reversed a lot of the incentives. Yeah, last note on this, by the way, is that, and we've talked about this before too, uh, you pick fights with your enemies. And so in a previous Judge Kaczmarek opinion, not this one, there's a uh, footnote where he's talking about an amicus brief, basically. And he says, sort of derisively refers to the amicus brief by um, a lawyer on Twitter, sorry, a law professor on Twitter. Sort of mocking it, derisive about why he doesn't care about this amicus brief, et cetera, that the government uh, mentioned, I guess, in the hearing. And it reminded me a lot of Judge Pryor also making snarky comments about reporters that he doesn't like. And it's the same problem. I don't know why these judges are elevating the people who they think aren't helpful, (laughs) aren't uh, covering the courts well, aren't the law professors who they think are. Uh, trying to explain the law in good faith to lay people on Twitter or otherwise. Whether you agree with whether he's right or wrong about those individuals, stop it. Stop picking fights with people. If you want to elevate the people who you think are doing a good job, um, and I think uh, there are plenty, and I've said that before too, but the picking fights thing is weird. It's beneath the office. And frankly, it elevates the very people who you say you don't want to elevate And so I question whether you aren't smart and I don't think that's the case. And instead, I think you want to pick the fight. You don't mind elevating them because you're elevating yourself. Uh, And I don't, again, in a pre-filibuster era, we'd never seen such a thing. And yes, it's a little hard to celebrate, uh, separate the filibuster from the rise of social media, from sort of the rise of judicial power as Congress has receded, as the executive branch has encroached, all of that. I agree. They're all intertangled in ways that I can't just say it's the filibuster alone, but it, I think has certainly been an unintended consequence of getting rid of the filibuster. But as you said, David, and I think it's worth a little bit of underlining, there's a reason that the filibuster went away. Maybe it went away too soon, but frankly, both sides weren't acting in good faith by that point. And we're holding up nominees, you know, and I'll, the, the left was holding up especially and just percentage wise, the non-white, non-male nominees from Republicans, George W. Bush in this case, Miguel Estrada, Priscilla Owen, uh, Janice Rogers Brown, the people who they thought would make for compelling Supreme Court nominees from Republicans, they wanted to make sure they never got on the circuit courts. It was disgusting. You were more likely to get on with bipartisan support as long as you were a white man. Yuck. And Democrats just like, we're fine with that. And then in the reverse, by the time Obama comes to office, Republicans were just blocking everyone. And they were. And uh, and they were doing it in a tit for tat. And they pointed back to Miguel Estrada. And then they pointed back to Bork. And like you end up in this like Capulet, you know, Montague situation where, well, it's a pox on both their houses and it will continue forever. And I you know, again, I think Harry Reid made a mistake. And I think you're right that he probably pulled the trigger too soon. There were other things that could have been tried at that point. But nevertheless, it's not like it came out of nowhere. It's true. It's true. You know, and then the Democrats signaled they they amassed 44 votes to filibuster Gorsuch. Okay. Which is a really interesting tactical move because there's just no argument that Gorsuch isn't someone qualified for the Supreme Court of the United States. I mean, this is a guy who's about as solid a nominee as you're going to bring forth and traditionally would have received an up or down vote without a filibuster uh, for decades and decades and decades. I mean, this is not somebody who was susceptible to being borked, for example. I mean, this, and they were going to filibuster Gorsuch. But, you know, look, Sarah, we all know that once the filibuster, once Harry Reid pulled the trigger on ending the filibuster for judicial nominees, what that meant was the the trigger was going to be pulled by one party or the other on the very next filibuster of a Supreme Court nominee. Like that, that was, that was inevitable at that point. Uh, And we're, we're absolutely living with the consequences, but I will still say, I will still say So far, so far, the court system has held up pretty darn well. Um, That 
if you're looking at, you know, now again, you and I can point to circumstances where I think an opinion wouldn't, maybe wouldn't have been issued or maybe wouldn't have been written the way it was written. There's a case that we talked about during the pandemic, remember where uh, a, a, a judge sort of wore out the, I believe it was the city of Louisville for its pandem pandemic era church regulations and did so in a court opinion that was far more of a polemic than it was a court opinion traditionally. So you can point to examples like that, but as a general matter, the system has held pretty darn well um, overall, which is why I strongly object to the illegitimacy argument about the court system. But with the caveat that we've not yet lived through a generation long shift with the filibuster and we'll see what that that leads to. Well, speaking of the court's legitimacy, let's put a pin in the dueling abortion rulings because, again, I know we're going to be talking about it for the next several episodes as we get appellate review on this. 